Amen. We're uh, moving into uh, really what is the third message on has asked me to come in and lay the foundation. This is a foundational teaching about the kingdom of God. If you were not here in the last sessions yesterday, we actually shared how the church has really been at a place where we've been emphasizing what is known as the gospel of salvation. But, you know, there's only one place in the New Testament where the gospel is called the gospel of salvation. That's in Ephesians 1.13. Everywhere else is called the gospel of grace, the gospel of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, or most commonly, it's called the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all the nations, all the ethnos, all the ethnic groups of the world, and then he said the end will come of the kingdom is preached as a witness to all the nations of the world. Now, if that is, seeing that's such an important thing, I mean, literally, the end will come when that's fulfilled, I think we need to know what the gospel of the kingdom is. I think we need to understand what the gospel of the kingdom is. 1 Corinthians 4.20 tells us the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is not in logos. Logos is the Greek term for the written word, the Bible. It saying that it's not just a message, in other words, but it comes in power. Do you know that the New Testament teaches that the kingdom of God always comes with power? Anytime the kingdom of God shows up, God manifests himself powerfully. The scripture tells us, Jesus speaking, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. The proof that the kingdom of God is present is the manifestation of power. Amen? And this is a truth that's found throughout the New Testament. For example, there's not a single reference in the New Testament, in the Gospels, to Jesus just preaching sermons to people. You know what it says? Matthew 4, 23 says that Jesus taught the people and he preached to them about the gospel of the kingdom and he healed all their sick. Any time, any reference in the New Testament to Jesus ministering, you're going to always see that he's moving in the supernatural. People are being healed Devils are being cast out, lepers are being cleansed, and even the dead are being raised. Jesus never preached just a sermon, but the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus literally carried with him wherever he went came with power. Hallelujah. You know, there are many Christians today, and I'm sure you've run into them, you know, we call those who don't believe in signs and wonders, don't, those who don't believe in miracles for today, you know, they say, well, all that stuff happened when, when the New Testament was written. We call them cessationists. And a person who does not believe in the gifts of the Spirit today, sometimes when you say, well, you know, it's important that we, we see the power of God emphasized today. We, we must see the tangible representation of God's kingdom on the earth with signs and wonders and miracles. And they look at you and say something like, well, doesn't the Bible say a wicked and adulterous generation seeks a sign? Well, the Bible does say that. But we have to understand that throughout the New Testament, we repeatedly see people coming to Jesus for healing and to receive other miracles. And in every single instance, Jesus complied without hesitation. There is not a single place in the New Testament where Jesus was approached by someone who needed a miracle and he said, sorry, I can't help you. It's not the will of my Father. In fact, if you study the New Testament, you'll see repeatedly that there is a reference that says something like this, and all were healed. <laughs> Laying his hands on each one, he healed them all, Luke 4.40. Laying his hands healed each one of them. Every one was healed. So who was Jesus speaking to? 
when he said an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. It was the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. He rebuked them, not the sick, not the dying, not the common person, not the tax collector, not the prostitute, but the religious leaders. And why did he say that? Because they had repeatedly witnessed the miracles, and yet they would not believe. But they kept saying to Jesus, show us one more sign. Do it again. It's interesting. Uh, we were ministering in, in the United States, in Illinois one time, and, and uh, God was just doing incredible things. People were being healed and miracles were occurring. And this one man came forward and he actually had a, a brain aneurysm and he had just been diagnosed with it and, and they were treating him. But it was, it was something that he was concerned about and was bothering him. And so he came forward. In fact, this man was not even a Christian. His wife invited him to the service. Now, his wife had been married, I think it was about seven or eight times previously. Now, what happens is, you'll understand why I'm referring to this in just a second. What happens is, he comes forward, I lay hands on him, and he hits the floor. I mean, there's nobody to catch him. In fact, you need about six men to catch this guy. It was that big. He hits the floor. He says, something's happened to me. I never felt anything like this before. I, I don't know what happened, but my legs gave out. I'm, he was shaking, and, and what ends up happening is he goes to the doctors just a few days after this. They run all the tests again, and there's no more brain aneurysm. I mean, the guy is completely healed. <laughs> now, here's what happens. This guy comes to the church, gets saved. His wife comes. She's just, she just got saved a few months before he did. And the people in the church, some of the people in this local church, actually make a comment like this. Well, I don't know about that. Look at the lifestyle they were living. I don't really know what we're going to do with these people. And I, I heard about this, and as it was shared with me, and I just became incensed. I, I was really ticked off. And I said, Lord, what is going on here? And the Lord, the Holy Spirit, led me to the passage. It's in Acts chapter 4, I believe, where you remember the man, the beggar at the gate, beautiful, who was healed? And what ends up happening is the religious people at the time, I mean, they see the guy standing there right in front of them. I mean, he, was, he was born in his mother's womb. From his mother's womb, he was crippled. And it says that he was more than 40 years of age. He was completely healed, and he's standing there in front of him, and the Scripture says something to this effect. The Pharisees speaking, the religious leaders speaking. Well, we know that a genuine miracles happen here. We can't deny it, but we don't like it. And let's just tell these apostles, let's tell these these guys just to shut up and stop speaking in the name of Jesus. But it says that we cannot deny, we cannot refute that a miracle has happened. But we're not going to believe. When Jesus said an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, he was speaking to those kind of people. Let me tell you that the Bible says that they had witnessed numerous miracles, but they hardened their hearts repeatedly. Jesus says in John 15, 24, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my Father. In the same passage in John 15, he says, if I hadn't preached, if I hadn't spoken the words that I've spoken, he said, then they would have no excuse. But he also speaks of the works. If I hadn't done the miracles, if I hadn't performed the signs and wonders. So now what he's saying is that I'm going to judge them at a different level. I'm going to judge them at a completely different level. Let me tell you, do you know what Jesus said about signs and wonders and miracles? He said that if miracles are absent, that we're not to believe the word the person's preaching. Uh-oh. Oh, come on. I'm going to say that one more time. 
and then I'm going to give you scriptural precedent for it. Jesus said, if there are no miracles, don't believe what the person's telling you. Referring to himself, here's what he said in John 10, 37 and 38. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Wow. If there's no miracles, don't believe me. But if you see miracles, then believe. And rather than just believe me, believe on the sake of the works that you may know that the Father is in me and I in him. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 8, I mentioned this verse previously in this, in this series. It actually says that it came to pass afterward that Jesus went through every city and village, now listen to this, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Jesus went through every city and every village, and what was he doing? Two things, preaching and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. He didn't just speak about the kingdom. He delivered the kingdom. He demonstrated the kingdom. He showed the kingdom. He made the kingdom of God a reality in their midst. John the Baptist is in prison. You know the story. He's doubting. You know, I wonder if Jesus is really the coming one. So he sends emissaries to Christ. Jesus, tell us, are you really the coming one or should we wait for somebody else? Should we anticipate someone else to come? Jesus' response in Luke chapter 7, listen to this. Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The show and tell gospel, the hear and see gospel. What did he say? Are you ready? He said, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Five tangible, identifiable miracles that can be seen. And one reference to the preaching of the word of God. Oh, hallelujah. Philip, deacon who got in a promotion, became an evangelist. The Bible says that a persecution breaks out in the church in Jerusalem. Philip goes down to the city of Samaria, preaches Christ to them. And the multitudes there with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. Captive audience. Can you imagine if you began to preach on the street corner in, in Lakeland, Florida, and I mean, eh, in the busiest place you could imagine, and everybody just stopped and listened. Now listen, it continues, and here's what it says. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. Why did they listen? Why did they give him their undivided attention? Are you ready? Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Come on. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Hallelujah. And then it continues and it says, Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Hallelujah. Praise be to his name. We were ministering not too long ago in, in the Niger Delta in Africa, and we had done a crusade, and Sunday morning came along, and I was asked to preach in a local church there, and as I was ministering, God, I really felt the power of God. You know, there's a scripture verse that says that the, the power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. And I felt that in a tangible way, that I knew there were going to be people healed. And I continued to minister about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I gave an invitation for people to respond and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And many people came forward, and, and God was, was demonstrating his power. One man came forward in particular. I will never forget. We prayed for this man. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke of tongues. A power of God hit him. He fell down. Later on, he contacted the pastor, and he said, Pastor, I, he said, I want to tell you that when that man laid his hands on me, I felt the power of God go through me. He said, I felt it, and I knew that I was filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, but I felt like a fire go through my whole body. 
And pastor, I didn't tell you this, but I was HIV positive and I've gone to the doctor and I've been checked out several times now and I'm no longer HIV positive. Hallelujah. Now what ends up happening after this is the pastor has a problem. He's got all these people are showing up to his church because they heard that people were being healed of AIDS. He heard that God was doing miracles. One woman there, literally, I'm telling you, it was one of the most awesome things I ever saw. She was sitting in the front row with her husband, and I could tell that they were, they were a, a, a wealthy couple, and, and the Lord told me to tell them that because of their faithfulness and sowing into ministries and, and all that they had done, that God said that they were to ask what it was that he, they needed, they wanted for God, and he would give it to them. And it reminded me of, of the prophet Elisha when he spoke to the Shunammite and said, what is it that you want? You know what she said? I want a son. We've been trying to have children for years, and we're not able. I want a son. And I spoke, and I said, go in peace, for God has granted you your request pastor told me about a year later they had a boy hallelujah people hear about these things and they came out of the wood they come out of the woodwork <laughs> we were down in in jamaica ministering set up a tent what ends up happening probably about the second or third night this young lady is literally carried to the front of the tent she has sickle cell, and her legs are twisted backwards. I mean, she can't walk. We, she, she was carried forward. We lay hands on her, commanded her to be whole in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, I, I looked at her, and it just blew me away. Her legs straightened out right in front of everybody. I mean, bop, just like that. And she got up, and she began to dance, and she began to get down. I'm telling you, and, man, the people came alive. Now, here's the part that scared the life out of me. <laughs> the pastor's on a cell phone. We're downtown in Kingston. Cell phone's ringing. Pastor's being told, Pastor, you've got to do something. There's going to be a lot of people showing up tonight. You're going to have to get a bigger tent. You're going to have to lengthen the cords and strengthen the stakes. You're going to have to do something because people are going to be showing up, Pastor. And so the pastor, you know, gets his man deployed, and they begin to put up a bigger tent. And that night, the place was packed out. And even before the service started, you know what happened? They started bringing people in vain. They went into the hospital and started bringing people. Now, I've read about that. You know, Lynn and I were not too long ago. We we're in Amy Semple McPherson's home in Los Angeles. We, I love that kind of stuff. And, you know, right there in Angeles Temple. And, and uh, what ended up happening, of course, in those days is that was happening as well. People were brought in. But we had read about this in history, but we had never seen this before. But here they are. One young man, he's about 16 years of age. He can't even walk. And before the service starts, we go over and lay hands on him. God instantly heals him. He gets up and he plays basketball all night long. He didn't even go to church. If I was God, I would have taken his healing from him. People were healed. People started coming from all over. And in the midst of all this, the last and final night that we were there, God showed me Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 is the story where Paul is ministering in one of the most wicked cities and what ends up happening while he's ministering there is God starts to do what the Scripture calls in the King James Version special miracles through the hands of Paul. New King James calls it extraordinary miracles. <laughs> now listen to me. To me, a miracle is a miracle. But he's talking about a different level now. Extraordinary miracles. God is healing the sick. Handkerchiefs, aprons, touching his body. Throw it on somebody, the demons come out. Throw it on somebody. Whatever the sickness, whatever the disease is, as soon as it contacts them, they're completely healed. The city comes out en masse, and they literally bring with them their accoutrements, their occult paraphernalia, and they burn it in the fire. We're talking about genuine, profound repentance. 
While we were ministering there that night, we had a similar experience where people started coming from out of the woods. I mean, people were coming from all over. Very few people had cars, but people were walking. They were getting there somehow. But I will tell you this one thing. And what took place was so many people came to Christ that night, and it was a genuine repentance. People were wailing. People were crying out. God was moving. There was like a, it was, it was scary. The holy presence of God was so strong that it was fearful. And people came to God. And I said, God, what are you about to do? And God took me to Acts 19, and he showed me that revival in the city of Ephesus. And I am believing the next time that we go back, that we are going to see a revival break out that is going to result in tens and tens and tens and hundreds of thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ. Here's what I'm saying. The gospel of the kingdom is not in word, it's in power. Paul said our, his speech, his preaching, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Paul continued, and he said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What was he saying? He said, when I came to you, I didn't come with wise, persuasive words. I didn't come as a philosopher. I didn't come as an eloquent speaker. But I preached a very simple message, but that message was backed up by the power of heaven. That message de was demonstrated in signs and wonders and miracles. Now, here's what he says. And it's important, it's critical, he says, that this happened because otherwise your faith might stand in the wisdom of men but not in the power of God. I'm, I'm making a, a point here. When the word of God is preached without power, I, I heard Bill Johnson say it's the spirit of Antichrist. Do you know what that means? Christos, the anointed one. It's against the anointing. It's doing it in our own strength. It's doing it with natural wisdom, natural ability, we're not ministering in the anointing. And the scripture says that if anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom the glory and dominion belong forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 4.11. What is he saying? He's saying this. If anyone ministers without the anointing, it's idolatry. Because somebody ministers. I mean, you, you, you turn on the radio. I'm not going to say any names. But you turn it on and you go, wow, that sounds good. But there's just not that. <clears throat> it's just not there. <laughs> and you know what? The, the words are good and, and the doctrine is sound. But there's just not a punch behind. And he's saying that people come and they say, well, that was an awesome sermon. Isn't, isn't he such an eloquent speaker? Didn't he just articulate that so well? But when someone ministers, when someone preaches, there must be the backing of heaven. And so at the end, what takes place is all the glory goes to Jesus Christ. We are hidden behind the cross. Jesus Christ receives all the glory because people are saying, surely the Lord was in the place. God was in the house. I felt his presence. His power was there. I can show you this repeatedly throughout the scripture, but time after time, we see in the hand of the Lord was with them. Four, was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. And he went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That's normal ministry. That's normal New Testament ministry. Going around healing all who are oppressed of the devil. But then the end of that verse says, for God was with him. The reason why he was able to do these things, very simple. God was with him. God was with him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that if you prophesy... And what happens is an unbeliever, an uninformed person comes in. The secrets of their heart are exposed or laid bare. They will fall down on their face and they will say, Surely God is in your midst. God is with you. We need 
the power of God in order to give glory to God, to take man's focus away from man, away from dead religion, away from a set of, of beliefs that are just doctrinal, bring people into an encounter with the living God. You know what scares me more than anything else? People that are raised in the church and don't know God. I'm not talking about, oh, I'm saved. No, no, no. God, God is, is the judge on that one. What I'm talking about is they don't know the mighty works of God. They don't know the power of God. They don't know how to step into that realm and experience the power of God in their own eyes. It says in Psalm 103 that the children of Israel saw God's acts, but only Moses knew his ways. You see, I don't want to just see the acts. I want to know his ways. I want to know what releases the anointing. I want to know what causes an open heaven. I want to know what causes the glory to come down. I want to know what sets me up to be an instrument in a channel so that when I speak the word, people are healed and delivered. Hallelujah. All were healed through Jesus' ministry. Jesus says to us, when he called his 12 disciples, and I believe it's applicable to us as well, he said, I give you power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Amen? That's what he said. Now, here's what he says. Now, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is drawn near to you. But then he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have you received, freely give. Without limit." You received, freely give. Now, I want you to note something. Jesus did not tell us to pray for the sick. He told us to heal the sick. Jesus did not say pray for the needy, pray for the lepers, pray for those who are oppressed, pray for those who are dead. He said, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out those demons, and heal the sick. Yeah. It's a command. He's not going to tell us to do something that we weren't capable of doing. It's his grace, it's his power, and his anointing. But we have to realize that. <laughs> I mentioned it earlier. When Jesus ministered, it says that he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. Matthew 8, 16. Peter, his shadow, ends up that the scripture says that a multitude gathers from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. You see, God is looking for a people today who will have this type of faith, who will consecrate themselves for greater works. Because what does the scripture say? If I was not, if, if I didn't know this was Jesus saying this, I'd have a hard time. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you, that he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also and even greater works than these he shall do. Because why? I go to the Father. I go to the Father. That's his promise. That is what he's commissioned us to do. He wants us to move into that realm. I'm going to be sharing with you that it's not just something that we just do. You know, many of us are Amalekites. You know, you know what the word Amalek means? Amalekites? No king. Malek is the Hebrew word for king. Ah, it negates. It's an antecedent. So he's saying, no king. See, many of us, we want the power of the kingdom, but we don't want to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's not the way it's going to work. 